from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you and good afternoon. On behalf of uh, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, the Chief of the African Middle Eastern Division, of whose reading room this is, and my colleagues in the division, I wish you all welcome to today's program. Uh, and I'm particularly uh, pleased to be able to welcome you, and I will say some other things a little later, because uh, today's presenter and I go back a considerable number of years. Now, as I think most of you know, uh, at this time, the Library of Congress has uh, put up a, uh, a big exhibition of uh, Persian uh, materials. And uh, this uh, lecture is part of an ongoing uh, set of lectures um, that if you look at our website, you will be able to see because some of them are here, some of them are at Maryland. And about that, and perhaps some other things, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Professor Fatima Keshavars to please come up and speak about that. Well, before anything else, I should say how delighted we are, the Roshan Institute, to be partnering with the Library of Congress, with our um, dear friends and colleagues, uh, Mary Jane Deep, I should say Dr. Deep, um, well, Chris just spoke, and uh, Hirad uh, Dinavari, the uh, Iranian world librarian, okay? Um, who have worked closely with us uh, and um, put this amazing exhibition together uh, called The Thousand um, Years of the Persian Book. And um, we, again, in collaboration, put this uh, speaker series together. I have been calling it a galaxy of stars. Really, I think it is. And you will, we can judge with today's talk, I'm sure, that that's no exaggeration. We are really delighted to bring from across the country, and, and some from Europe, actually, speakers who would teach us about uh, the Persian-speaking world and the activity of learning and transmission of knowledge, and that does not limit, is not limited to um, Iran in this national definition, but to a much broader constellation of cultures. Um, though this would have not been possible for us to do without the spe uh, special support and help from the Roshan Cultural Heritage Institute, and specifically with a personal gift from Dr. Elahemil Jalali. Uh, it's really my pleasure to thank her for that, and so uh, everything came together to really enable us to do this. Um, I would have loved to introduce my friend Ahmad, whose book, when it came out, uh, recasting Persian poetry really fired our imagination to do with the understanding of the concept of modernity in literature and what happens basically to this, happened to this old concept which now he was giving us a new way of looking at, whether it's his translations that are really a treasure trove of poetry made accessible to English speakers. Also, many of you know what an accomplished teacher he is and how he really connects with people. But I've promised Chris to let him introduce Ahmad properly, and I think he has a right to do so for the reason that he mentions I let him do that. Ahmad John, it's a great pleasure to listen to you, and thank you so much for accepting to be one of our stars in the galaxy. Thank you. In thinking about uh, introducing Ahmed, um, I almost got bogged down, but then I found a wonderful and, you know, very succinct uh, list of his accomplishments, and I will go through that, and I will remind you that this is simply a very brief list uh, for a very accomplished scholar who uh, I am so pleased to have come and speak here. Um, okay. For 19 years, uh, Ahmed Karimi Hakak was professor of Persian language and literature and Iranian culture and civilization at the University of Washington. And that's where I first met him. Um, Ahmed received his doctorate from Rutgers in 1979, 
I received mine from the University of Washington in uh, 1980 and was for several years employed there uh, in the library. And that's when I first met him. And uh, my impression of him then has been uh, completely fulfilled with uh, the trajectory of his career. Um, okay. He's taught English and comparative literature and translation studies, as well as classical and modern Persian literature at the University of Tehran, Rutgers, Columbia, the University of Texas. He's the author of 19 books and uh, over 100 articles. And uh, Fatima Hanum just spoke of his book on recasting Persian literature, which is a truly seminal work in the field. He has been the author of many uh, articles in uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica and other encyclopedias. And he has been translated into French, Dutch, Spanish, Russian, Greek, Arabic, Japanese, and Persian. And he is, of course, the recipient of numerous awards, including, I believe, an award that took him to India a few years ago to uh, study Persian literature as produced in India. So without further ado, I would like to ask my very good friend and uh, old colleague, Ahmed Kareem Hakak, to come up and uh, let us How wonderful to be standing here in front of you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Dr. Deep, for being here. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Hirad, for all that you've done. And Fatime, this is amazing, this, this, this seri the series the exhibition and everything. It's so fitting with the kind of person you are, always uh, bringing new things to us for contemplation and for participation. Uh, it's most appropriate that I'm standing here. I did my dissertation on the Shah Nami here in this building, 1977-1979. Uh, also in the uh, building back there, the Oriental reading room there at that time. Uh, so this has been something of a home to me uh, which really has nurtured me and has uh, uh, guided me through uh, the career that, that uh, so generously was expressed by uh, Chris and Fatime. Uh, if there's anything about this library is that, is that really it's a secular temple uh, and a place of culture. This august room is so impressive imposing, but not intimidating. It's an amazing place to be able to roam in and to delight in what it holds. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Dr. Deep, for uh, making this possible and for including me in the, in the series. I appreciate that. Uh, what I thought I would be doing was probably just simply touch a few little themes here and there uh, in the Shahnameh, and then go through a chronology of, uh, uh, as of, of this book, this really foundational text. I can't think of, I don't think everyone, I, anyone uh, would take an exception to the fact that this is really the most foundational book in Persian literature. Uh, even the exhibition speaks very uh, eloquently about the, the place of this particular text in the culture and through time. Uh, so I'll walk, I'll walk this book through time, but it, it will have to be very, very brief, uh, number one, because our time is brief, and number two, because I'm very eager to uh, engage you in questions of various kinds. I'll be addressing, the, you have a handout, you have two handouts actually, one in Persian and one in English. I'll be uh, addressing the English because uh, uh, the talk itself is in English, but feel free to, at the same time, to glance over at the Persian book. They're the same thing, and they highlight the same texts, about seven or eight excerpts which really illustrate the points that I'll be making during my talk. Uh, so I think in, in this talk today, I would like to ask us to conceptualize the Shahnameh as a point of confluence of certain ideas that may have gathered over time and are caught in a moment of convergence and that may, that may release new ideas in time unimaginable to its author and to the people who, who contributed in substance over time to this work. If this description conjures up the shape of an hourglass in your mind, 
This is deliberate. Indeed, I would like to invite us to imagine Ferdowsi's Shahnameh as a product of the coming together of diverse strands of thought that, if not always contradictory, look, at least at times, incongruous and discordant, uneasy cohabitants living within the same textual space. Or better yet, ideas that may reflect the form of a verbal exchange, many verbal exchanges, in fact, a dialogue, a debate, a collection of discussions. Written in verse over three decades towards the end of the 10th century, and perhaps into the first decade of the 11th century of the Common Era, it is a leviathan of a book by a single author we now know as Abul Qasim Ferdowsi. It broaches no fewer than five millennia of myth, history, and myth history. Myth history is my word for those things which we cannot distinguish, in which we cannot distinguish the uh, historical element from the mythical element. Uh, let me present a synopsis of this work in uh, a few minutes. In all its aspects, the Shahnameh cannot properly be called the work of a single author, just because of what I have said right now. The actions recounted in many of its stories, for instance, have their origin in the various traditions or groups of traditions related to ancient Persia and available to the poet in oral or written form. This work contains a collection of poetic narratives versified and arranged chronologically. It has come down to us through the centuries in a series of manuscripts which are less confused and defective in their general substance and order, na order of narration than in details of diction and phraseology. Modern scholarship has further clarified the matter of the original contents of the Shahnameh and questions relating to the arrangement of, this, of, the, of the stories. As a result, today, the Shahnameh of Ferdowsi refers to a fairly well-defined work available in so many Persian editions as well as in translation to numerous languages. And I would like to recognize the work that Mohammed and Najmi Batmangalich have done for the English editions of this book that has made it both authentic and very, very pleasant to look at, even for children. The Shahnami begins at the beginning of time, when God created things from nothing and ends with the fall of the Persian Empire to the Muslim Arabs toward the middle of the seventh century of the Common Era. It tells the story of the birth, rise, and fall of the empire, comprising about 50 reigns of widely unequal duration and significance. Although any compartmentalization of the Shahnameh into separate parts is bound to be somewhat artificial and subjective, it is important to bear in mind that the work moves from what is obviously mythical to what is clearly history. It is therefore possible to speak of, a, of an early and predominantly mythical segment and a later or predominantly historical one, with the death of Rostam, the main hero of the work, as the turning point. It is important, however, to note that neither the first portion can be said to be totally fa fantastical, nor the second can be, can be part viewed as completely devoid of heroic or fabulous incidents. Nevertheless, in each part, the dominant character of the epic is deliberately reinforced by the tone and quality of the narrative voice. As myth turns into history, the poet's ardor seem, seems to cool somewhat, and the narrative assumes a sober, detached, and increasingly subdued presence, the narrator does. As the tragic end of the empire nears, the narrator appears weary, and cheerless, obviously affected by the course of events. In the end, however, the reader's patience is richly rewarded in the, distant, in the distinct feeling that her journey through myth and history has been made in the company of one who has made her perhaps sadder, but definitely wiser. Opening the work in the name of the God of life and wisdom, the poet speaks briefly of the creation of the celestial luminaries, the earth and man. He then tells us how it happened 
that once a Khurasani Dehqan of noble character and enlightened spirit began to seek the stories of his ancient motherland. He gathered from all over the world, all over the realm, old custodians of ancient chronicles. How did they run the world in the beginning, he inquired of the assembly, that they left it to us in such a sorry state. Kegiti az aghaz chun daashtan ki idun be ma khar bugzaashtan. The question prompted the men to begin to reveal stories of kings and heroes of the times gone by. The noble Dehran then laid the foundation of the work to remind all ages of the beginnings of the Persian Empire. At the head of all kings stands Qumars, king and master over the whole world. He is clothed in leopard skin and lives in the mountains. Qumars' son Siamak is killed by a div, a demon. And thus, Qumars reigns, Qumars is, uh, and thus Qumars' reign is followed by, by that, that of the, his grandson, Hushang, who makes tools, tills the land, domesticates some animals, and above all, discovers fire. Similarly, Hushang's son, whose main achievement is the domestication or defeat of the demons, earns himself the title of Tahmuris, the demon binder, Tahmuris, the div band. With Jamshid, Jamshid, son and successor to Tahmuris, the march towards civilization quickens. The king initially uses his royal far, that is divine glory, or divine glory for, for the good of mankind. He cultivates the land, builds dwellings, exploits the mines, and provides structure for human society. However, witnessing all the good he has done, Jamshid grows increasingly vain and defiant, saying, I know no lord over the world but my own self. As a result, the divine fair forsakes him. He comes to an ignominious end. His realm falls to discord, and the demonic Zahak conquers his kingdom. As they are portrayed in the Shahnameh, Qumars, Hushang, Tahmuris, and Jamshid are little more than quaint mythical figures rising out of the misty chaos of prehistory to lead the human society to order. Nevertheless, they exhibit an increasingly noticeable degree of personality, gradually bestowing on the narrative a growing human dimension. Zahak is one of the few figures in the Shahnameh with a distinct allegorical aspect. He is more an embodiment of the evil enemy of mankind than the demoniacal conqueror of Iran, an oppressor of Iranians. With him, the drama of, of good and evil heightens. Unsuspectingly, he admits the devil to his presence, allowing him to kiss his shoulders as a sign of gratitude and affection. Two hungry serpents grow on the king's shoulders, constantly rearing their, head, their heads ferociously. Again, unwittingly seeking counsel from the devil, Zahak begins to murder the youth of the land, feeding their brains to the menacing beasts grown on his shoulders. He is finally faced with a popular revolt led by Kaveh the ironsmith, who has lost 17 sons to Zahak's evil affliction. Kaveh then leads the oppressed Iranians to where Feridun, the true heir and of, to the throne of Jamshid and the possessor of the divine Far, lives in anonymity with his mother. Feridun moves at the head of the popular army, captures Zahak and chains him to the scorched, to, to, to be scorched, to the scorched rocks of Mount Alborz, where the tyrant perishes from hunger and thirst. Placed on the throne, Feridun rules with liberality and justice. Dado Dahish, until his old age when he divides his vast realm among his three sons, giving the fairest of them all, Iran, to Iraj, the youngest and the most virtuous. Iraj is treacherously murdered by his jealous brothers, his head sent to the aged Feridun. Eventually, Manucher, Iraj's son, exacts his father's vengeance and succeeds his grandfather, 
Feridun to the throne of Persia. With the story of Feridun and his sons, the Shahnameh takes a decidedly national and territorial tone, which it preserves up to the end of, uh, of its narrative. As the national dimension comes to dominate the narrative, Ferdowsi's poetry assumes enhanced vigor, vitality, and majesty. From here on, the increasingly bitter wars between Iran and Turan begin to reflect territorially the cosmic struggle already outlined in Jamshid's downfall and Zahak's overthrow and demise. Rostam, the principal hero of the Shahnameh, is born at this time during the reign of Manucher. His birth is indeed the marvelous culmination of a tender love story between Zal and Rudabe. Rostam's father, Zal, having been born white-haired, a sign of ill forebodings, is exposed by his father, Sam, on Mount Alborz. He is raised and nursed by Simur, the fantastic bird of Persian mythology. His mother, Rudabe, is a descendant of Zahak, the serpent-shouldered demonic usurper of the Persian throne. Sam, Zal's father, is therefore understandably concerned about the outcome of such a marriage. What fruit shall come, he wonders, what race of being from, one, from the union of one raised by a bird and one born of the demon. As in more parvardo on the Ivzad, Chegune Barayat, Chebashad Nejad. The fruit is Rostam, a hero of super, superhuman strength, acumen, and longevity, whose whole life of nearly 600 years is spent at the service of his beloved Iran. Rostam's life, in fact, dominates the history of Iran from the reign of Keikobad through those of Keikavuz, Keikhosro, Lohrasp, and of Goshtasp. The stories of Haft Khan, the seven labors of Rostam, of his war against the white demon, of his combat against the Emperor of China, of his many encounters with Afrasiab, of his part in the adventures of Keikavus, Bijan, Furud, and a host of other personages in the Shahnameh, all depict the numerous stages in the eventual life of this unforgettable hero. His complex character is gradually revealed through the figures around him and around the courts of Iran and Turan. The lives of such figures as the wise and staid Gudars, the adventurous Giv, the bold Tahmineh, the romantic and dashing Bijan, the loving Manijé, the willful and hot-headed Tus, the pious and loyal Piran, and the wily and sinister Afrasiab all help illuminate intricate tendencies that make Rostam a thoroughly fascinating character. At the same time, the drama of the hero's life finds intense expression in three of the most affecting stories of the Shahnameh, each of which I believe can turn, can, captivate, can uh, cap capturing a turning point in his career. The first, the story of Sohrab, the second is the story of Siavash, and the third and final one is the story of Esfandiar. I have sections on each one which I'm going to skip for now, unless they come up in the question and answer. But the third and most dramatic moment is that of the battle of Rostam and Esfandiar. Esfandiar, the king's son, Goshtasp's son, and would-be successor, champions the cause of Zoroastrianism, fighting many wars in the service of the new faith. Goshtasp, Himself, having gained access to the throne through treachery and an unholy alliance with the enemies of Iran, promises it to Esfandiar, his son, at the beginning of many major undertakings. But each time when the task is accomplished, he finds himself reluctant to leave the throne to his son. Finally, he vows that he would relinquish the, the reign in favor of Esfandiar should the latter bring Rostam to his presence with hands bound. The treacherous king thus causes the engagement of the ambitious prince Esfandiar, who is invulnerable except for his eyes, and the mighty hero Rostam in a futile confrontation from which no winner can emerge. 
Rostam, having exhausted all his resources and craft and guile in an effort to avert the doom, finally asked for his father, Zal's help, who enlists the aid of Simor. The mythical bird tells him that Esfandiar can be killed only if an arrow made of tamarisk wood is shot straight into his eyes. At the same time, the bird war warns Rostam that Esfandiar, Esfandiar's murderer, shall meet a disastrous end. Rostam is thus faced with a dilemma. Submit to the disgrace of being dragged with, bo with bound hands before the king whom he despises, or prepare for the preordained consequences of murdering the Zoroastrian prince. Rostam chooses the latter. Victory is won, but he dies shortly afterwards, a victim of his evil half-brother Shagad's treasury, treachery. With the death of the mightiest of Shahnameh's heroes, the narrative is left emptied of that imposing presence, and little remains to sustain the mythical structure of the Shahnameh. Following the deaths of Esfandiar and Rostam, the stories of three of Goshtasp's successors, Bahman, Darab, and Dara, are quickly told and the narrative next focuses on Alexander, whose story in the Shahnameh is largely based on uh, pseudo calisthenes a Greek text. Having acceded to the throne of Rome and conquered Egypt, Alexander turns his attention to the east. He conquers Iran, marches to Babylon, invades India, explores the land of darkness in search of the water of life, and finally dies a holy man of wisdom and nobility. Aside from the account of his mythical adventures, what is significant about Alexander, as he appears in the Persian epic, relates to his parentage. He is, according to the Shahnameh, the older son of the Iranian, Iranian king, Dara, a Persian. His victory is therefore portrayed not as a foreigner's conquest of the beloved land of Iran, but as the triumph of legitimacy, a tour de force indeed. The importance of this fiction in the national epic of Persia cannot be overemphasized. Ferdowsi, however, seems to have versified the story of Alexander with an ambivalent mind and a hesitant hand. It is as if the poet himself is not totally convinced of the worth of the fables that he broaches together. Despite Ferdowsi's gallant efforts, Alexander remains a uniquely alien character in the Persian epic. After Alexander, the Shahnameh enters its more or less historical period and segment. Insofar as scholarship has determined, Ferdowsi follows his known sources rather closely. However, he focuses with renewed vigor on the lives and adventures of a few of the Sassanid kings and heroes. The royal adventures of Bahram Gur, which also later Nizami tells as well, are narrated in a totally fabulous world of dream and romance. So here we are leaving the solid objective ground of epic and going into the dark woods of romance, if you will. The story of the reign of Anushiravan too is told in an idealized manner, depicting that monarch as the paragon of justice and wisdom. While leaving aside many actual historical events, such as the suppression of the Mazdakis, known to have taken place during his long reign. The Shahnameh next concentrates on the episode of Bahram Chubin, the defiant head of Khosrow II's imperial army and the military exped exped ex expeditions which this enigmatic warrior leads against his, the en his enemies. From there, the narrative moves rapidly through time, concentrating on the tragic account of the fall of the Persian Empire, culminating in the Battle of Qadisiyya. As the end of the empire approaches, the poet assumes an increasingly evident tragic tone, incorporating images of decay and philosophical observ observations on mutability and the predominance of fate into his narrative. The last of the Sassanid monarchs, Yazdgird, that tragic figure, and the brave but doomed chief 
of the Persian army are portrayed with the greatest sympathy and affection. The sad but resigned letter which this general, Rostam Farrokhzad, we know him as, dispatches to his brother, communicates the downfall, the inevitability of the downfall. The symbolic mutilation of Rostam's body, whose very name recalls that mighty bulwark of olden times, now dead for over a thousand years, provides a fitting end to Ferdowsi's tragic epic. The Shahnameh closes with Ferdowsi's regenerative epilogue, where the poet celebrates his own immortality. I will never die, he says. He exclaims in proud humility, but will live on, for I have sown the seed of words. Namiram az in pas ke man zindam ke tukhme sukhan ra parakandam. Clearly, a work of this magnitude harbors within it many voices and visions. Here, I would like, in what remains of the time, to draw a basic dis distinction between the voice of the champions and kings within the story and one reflecting the author's vision, found in the preliminaries and what we may call his postscript to the tragic story he has just told. The first voice within the narrative is one of a particular people, a particular race of man, and the emergence and evolution of their view of themselves as a distinct and distinguishable breed. As might be gleaned from the synopsis, the paradigm governing this process is racial, with all its trappings in place. However, what Ferdowsi offers us in the end is not racial, it's linguistic, it's language. Before entering the narrative, however, Ferdowsi offers a vision different from that of, of, of the narrative that he finds. Uh, here he praises the God of life and wisdom, as I said before, professes his, his adherence to a vision of Islam, which comes close to modern Shia version, and tells the story of how the book came to be and ends by paying homage to his powerful patron, Sultan Mahmud. On the other hand, after he closes the story and history he has, he has re related, he briefly recalls the many years of his spent, the many years he has spent on the work. Thanks to the king, thanks the king once more, mentions his age, the date of the work's completion, and predicts his own immortality as the Dehqan who in sowing the seed of words has revived the Persian language and in doing so has secured his own fame forever. What the readers of the Shahnameh have done over the past millennium with its na narrative and the author's vision, how they have related these to their lives and circumstances and what perspectives they may have seen in it constitutes a complex of examples of continuity and creativity, of creativity and relevance, and of relevance in all its varieties. We know precious little about the responses and, and reactions to the work that the work may have ins instigated in the poet's immediate audience. We know that the poet's effort was widely admired and that fanciful stories, and we have fanciful accounts of how he constructed the work and how the work remained unrewarded and unappreciated. The earliest arena where we begin to see attempts at redirecting the assets of the Shahnameh toward utilitarian purposes is in the shaping of the Gnostic vision among the, myst the Persian mystics of the 12th century. And here let me invite you to look at the first uh, the first item on the handout. It's by Sohrevardi, a mid-12th century uh, mystic who had much to do with, uh, with, with the development of, of Gnostic vision among the Sufis. What he does is, interestingly, he vacates the epic of, from the Shahnameh to redirect it into some sort of internal. I've called this interiorization. He interiorizes. And this, he's not alone in this. Think of what happens to Simur between the Shahnameh and the Mantiqutayr. In the Shahnameh, he's a big bird, corporeal, the size of 30 birds perhaps. In the Mantiqutayr, Conference of the Birds, 
He's not a creature. He's a presence. Think of what happens to Jama Jam. Jama Jam is a true object. It's a real object. You can touch it. You can look into it. You can feel it. You can empty it. But as Sanai would have us believe, so he transfers it within. It's as if the whole asset system of this objective world is turned inward into the human, human soul. Think of Rostam and all the deeds, demons and dragons that he has to fight. Now think of Sheikh Sam'an. All he has to fight is his nafs. But that's the greater of the enemies. So this is an amazing shift that happens in, in Persian poetry through the 12th century to prepare the assets of the romantic and epic uh, narratives for mystical expressions, towards mystical uh, works. And here's what, here's what the, the, the part that Soravardi plays. There's this, he makes this up. He's, he, this, is, this is totally made up. But listen to it. There's this capacity in Simorg that if you place a mirror in front of it, any eye casting a gaze on it will be blinded. Zal made a coat of arms for Rostam, polished all over, and clad Rostam in it, and placed a polished hood on his head, and fastened polished mirrors to his steed. He then took Rostam to the field of battle, where Esfandiar had to approach him, and as he did so, raised from Simorg's body, fell upon the coat and the mirrors, and the reflection darted back to Esfandiar's eyes, blinding him. He fancied, fancied, didn't happen. He fancied that his eyes must have received a wound, for he saw nothing at all. That's how he fell down from his horse and was killed at the hands of Rostam. You might say that the two-headed arrow you've read in fables were Simorg's wings. Isn't that a wonderful re-articulation? It's an amazing feat he does. So it, 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 it didn't exist. It all is in the mind. It's all part of an internal world. The second trend I would like to, uh, to highlight very briefly is the advice, the tradition of advice in Persian literature. Ferdowsi in the Shahnameh does his own share to begin this advice. When speaking of Feridun and his qualities, he says, you are Feridun. Just be generous and just. So what, it's possible. Or another moment of subjectivity in the middle of an objective epic. As Rostam and Sohrab have fought the second day and to exhaustion. He stands aside and confides in the reader. Say, telling us uh, that there was no kharat. They did, they did not have kharad, and that's why they, they, they were fighting one another. And as a result, they, you should consider them lower than the animals. Jahana shegifti zikirdar tost, shekaste hamasto, hamasto durost. As in do, yeki ra najom bid mehr, kharad dur bud, mehr nan mucher. Hami bachera baz donat sutur, che mahi be darya, che dar dasht gur, nadonat hami adam az. هرس و آز، رنج و آز، یکی دشمنی را ز فرزند باز. So, warning, invitation, advice, all of these are in the Shahnameh. Saadi links up with that. And look how beautifully he links up. Well indeed spoke Ferdowsi, the blessed born, may God shower blessing, blessings upon the earth where he rests. Do not harm the ant bearing a grain, for it possesses life, and sweet life is good. Do not, raise, do not raise your hand upon the weak man's head, for like an ant, someday you may fall before his feet. چه خوش گفت فردوسی پاکزاد که رحمت بر آن طربت پاک باد میازار موری که دانکش است که جان دارد و جان شیرین خوش است. مزن بر سر ناتوان دست زور Reversals of fortune happen all the time. In another thing, and this is where 
I link up with a tradition of another Shahnameh. It's true that we have had the Shahnameh and over the centuries its limits have been, have been, uh, have been determined and we have a text called the Shahnameh. But that is us, those people who read and care for these things. There's another Shahnameh in, the pop, in popular culture, in the popular Iranian culture, and it keeps feeding on, it, on, on, on this and other texts. It amplifies and it, and it censors and it changes and it deepens and it widens the Shahnameh, the canonical Shahnameh of Ferdowsi. So when Sadi says, Shah, in ke dar Shahnameh ha avardan, he's not referring just to Ferdowsi. We don't even know how much Ferdowsi's heirs may have really had access to the text of the Shahnameh. We know the legends were there. We know that they heard some things about the Shahnameh. They did not have access to the Shahnameh as we have it in bound volumes from here to there. So this, 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 this non-canonical Shahnameh is growing all the time. And of course, the greatest thing happens to it in the Naqali tradition of the Safavi times and on. So Saadi, in ke dar Shahnameh ha avardan rostam o ruin tan esfandiyar ta bedanand in khodavandan mulk kazbasi khalq ast alam yadgar. So it's not that the Shahnameh is the index of Iranian identity to Saadi. It is this, the world is old. We are heir to a very old world. And, and, and there have been many, many generations who have in, inherited the earth. That, that in the Shahnameh, they have related fables of Rostam and Isfandiyar, the invincible, is so those who rule over, uh, over realms should know tabidan and in khodavandan mulk that this world is left from masses of god's creatures kazbasi khalq ast alam yadgar now a second tradition a third tradition really uh, that takes off and, and relates to the shahnameh is what i call in the ghazal tradition culminating in, in hafiz i call it emotional distillation to hafiz it is not important, the story of Siavash and Garcivaz and what happened to him in, to, in Turan and how he was beheaded. What's important is a feeling that he detects in that. Shame on Afrasiyab for believing in the bad-mouthing that Garcivaz, his brother, did against the Siavash, telling him that he was going to raise an army and move against the Turanian king. It's that aspect that's very important to Hafiz because emotions are very important to him. So uh, what, what, what we have here is really the, when he says, king of the Turks listens to the words of false pretenders, may he or she feel shame for the injustice handed to Siavash. This is Hafez. Shah Turkan Sukhan Muddayan Mishinavad Sharmi as Mazlami Khune Siavush Ashbad. And Shah Turkan is Afrasia, but it's not Afrasia. It is his beloved. And the shame and the, 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 the one who has been wronged is not Siavash, but it is Siavash, but it's also the speaker of his poem. So, Sharmi as Mazlami Khune Manashba. It's amazing the kind of bridges made that, that the, this lyrical tradition makes to the Shahnameh. Let's contemplate this other one. Tekibar Akhtar Shabgard Makun Kin Ayar Taj Kavus Rabudo Kamare Kaykhosro Garravi Pako Mujarrat Chumasi Habe Falak as Furugeto Bukhorshi Resat Sat Parto. Or, do not rely on the night roaming star for, the, for this thief, that thief has stolen Kekavus's crown and Kekhosro's girdle. Go to skies Christ-like, pure and perfect at your departure. And a hundred rays will reach the sun from your lamp. Three characters, Kekhosro and Kekavus, opposite characters in the Shahnameh. Kekhosro is the good king, Kekavus is the bad and stupid king. Nonetheless, they are both earthly. 
It takes and someone from another mythological system, Christ, as he has been so beautifully articulated in Persian poetry, that really demonstrates to us what abstract is, what mujarrad is, the concept of mujarrad, the concept of purity. So, once again, we have three characters who stand in different relations. While he, Hafiz, gives us a signal that he has read these stories, he has heard these stories, that's not the point. The point is, there's a difference between man and God, or semi-God, or whoever Hafiz thought uh, Christ might be. Now, the other stage, if you will, historical stage, where the popular culture links up with the Shahnameh is in this wonderful example that I love. I'll read it to you, and then we'll discuss it briefly. This is, this is in, in, in a collection of books that the late Abu al-Qasim in Javi Shirazi collected uh, called Mardum ba Shahnameh. One day Rostam, son of Zal, was moving on to capture Solomon's crown and throne. Along the way, he reached a narrow passageway and saw that another horseman was advancing from the opposite side. That horseman was Imam Ali. He said to the Imam, hold your horse. The Imam responded, you hold your horse. In the end, Imam Ali rushed his horse forward and got the stirrup to grab the edge. The narrow passageway gave way and began to widen, making way for the two riders to pass. As they came face to face, Imam Ali asked, where are you headed? Rustam, son of Zal, responded, I am moving on, moving on to capture Solomon's throne and, cra and crown. Imam Ali said, I am one of Solomon's slaves. You will succeed in capturing Solomon's crown and throne if you first wrestle me to the ground. Rostam took on the challenge and began to grapple with the Imam. He pressed so hard that blood began to flow from his nostrils, but he was unable to throw the Imam to the ground. He then said, your turn. And the Imam lifted Rostam on two fingers, two of his fingers, and threw him up to the skies. Rostam went up so high that he reached the angels. And they said to him, say, I am Rostam, champion of the world. O Imam Ali, grant me mercy, grant me safety. Al-Aman, Al-Aman. Rostam repeated those words until he reached back to the earth. Imam Ali held him with his two fingers and placed him on, gently on the ground. Rostam professed faith in the Imam and converted to Islam. And because of that, Imam Ali engirdled him. And Rostam gave up the idea of capturing Solomon's crown and throne. I would have too. <laughs> so, what do we see here? A system of signification that has nothing to do with the Shahnama of Ferdowsi, but has everything to do with the Safavid ambition and ideology to convert Iranians into Shiism. Because after all, they've got two powerful enemies, the Uzbeks to the Northeast and the Ottomans, much more powerful to the Northwest. So they needed, and there's evidence that this happened, they needed to mobilize both systems of mythology, where the Rosakhans would, would climb the, mob, the pulpit and would say to the recently recruited uh, conscripts from villages, you are the sons of Rostam and Sohrab, and those you're going to fight tomorrow are the sons of Yazid and Muawiyah. And they would, the, the, he would then climb down, and the Shah Khan would climb and say, you are the sons of, uh, the, 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 the Rose Khan, you are the sons of uh, uh, Hussein and Ali, and uh, they are the sons of Yazid and Muawiyah. I, I messed it up, but you, you know which one I mean. So, uh, again, utilitarian use of the Shahnameh has been rampant throughout the history of, of, of Iran, in fact. And it has responded to various things beautifully, always, as I said, re making itself relevant to people's concerns. Uh, by the time ambitions of modernity roll around, there's another re-articulation of the Shahnameh's significance. I have a cit citation, which is on page two, uh, about the poets of Europe by Mirza Agha Khan Kermani, who, he's, who says, uh, Persian poetry is all nonsense. It has been. It needs to change. The only poet of, of, of all times 
that Europeans, and why Europeans, you don't know. Uh, the Europeans admire is Ferdowsi. Look at what he says. Uh, the only Persian poet whom the literatures of Europe admire is Ferdowsi of Tus, whose poems in the Shahnameh, even though they are not free from exaggerations in some places, inculcate love of nationality, courage, and bravery to an extent. And in some places, he even strives to improve our morality. I see them fast approaching my time. I have three more texts for you. Two of them are by Zabihullah Safa. Apparently, in his youth, in the 1930s, when the passions of, 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 of shall we call it, fascistic nationalism was, were being whipped in Iran, uh, he wrote a, an article called Shu'ubiyat uh, Ferdosi in the journal Mehr and, and, and uh, called Ferdosi as Shu'ubi, who actually you know, chides the Arabs and denigrates the Arabs and, and so on and so forth. Uh, almost 40 years later, when another revolution happened in the name of the same religion that the Arabs brought to Iran, he recants, he recants. And he says, in spite of the researches that have been conducted into the Shahnameh and its sources as a result of efforts by European scholars, some people still think that in versifying the Shahnameh, Ferdowsi has worked on the basis of his own inclinations. And he says, I too was afflicted by such, by such an error such errors early in my career. And some of the traces of this, traces of this affliction uh, is evident in an article that I wrote, and he refers to his earlier article. So people have even uh, retracted their works on the Shahnameh, depending on circumstances. And finally, there's this sc Iranian scholar in Hamburg, Germany, uh, Jalal Khalaghi Mutlaq, who has spent nearly half a century to give us a, a, a more authentic version of the Shahnameh. Nonetheless, he too has fallen victim to his own, shall we say, Iranianness, nationalism. Uh, so listen to what he says, and this is my last thing, and I'll, and I'll fall silent and, and try to solicit your opinion. In fact, towards the end he says, the last four lines, in fact, what's most surprising in studying the history of Arab conquests is that even as they plundered all the, prop, all the property of the enemy, even as they took an enemy's women and children and raped the women, at the same time, they incessantly put on pretenses about their poverty and piety and inattention to worldly possessions. Bad, bad, bad people. So, uh, to conclude, hazards of too much absorption in, t in the text of the Shahnameh aside, it seems that much modern Iranian sentiment about the Shahnameh suffers from a chronic case of extreme and unbridled nationalism that some modern Iranians still harbor when they idealize pre-Islamic Iran, contrasting it, that imaginary state of affairs, to the present inglorious history that is being made daily in their name. At the same time, they erroneously read the narrative of the Shahnameh as containing the vision of the poet as well. One can hope that in time, such flagrant excesses and errors may be moderated and corrected, and genuinely new attitudes begin to emerge that in appropriating to work the works of literature, in approaching the works of literature, can separate the authorial voice and vision from those of the personages inside the text. Thank you for your attention. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. There's, you know, there's, there are all kinds of Shahnames and Padishah Names and Shah and Shah Names and all kinds of things. None of it has really uh, attained any status, uh, let alone anything comparable to the Shahnameh. Perhaps, and this is going to surprise some people, perhaps the one that is most sincerely felt is the Mikaduname. This was written in 1906 
on the occasion of the victory of the Japanese over the Russians, who were the bad guys of early 20th century Iran. And so Mikado, being the, um, the J um, uh, Japanese emperor, was really, uh, you know, celebrated in a way that, uh, that Kei Khosro or Manuchir, the good guys in the Shahnameh, are separated. But of course, in terms of the diction and the artistry, it's not comparable. The other thing is, is of course, George Nome, that was written on George III in, in Delhi during the time of, uh, that, that India was colonized. Uh, but of course, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's an amazing fact that no one has been able to uh, attain to any standing that comes close to the Shahnameh of Ferdowsi, which really also testifies to how topics nearby will not do, it seems as though. It seems as though time will has to sweep by and wash away all the impressions of the moment that people may form and really become part of a canon that lies far enough in the past so that you can really tackle it and tackle it with some artistry. Thank you for asking that question. Mohammed? <coughs> Of course, of course. Goes without saying. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, of course, my, our colleague Dick Davis has done a marvelous job of translating the Shahnameh. And I understand he's finishing up the whole thing. He has done episodes, and now he's, he's doing the rest. And, and it's a very good book. Thank you for reminding me. The non-canonical, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. Thank you very much. I recommend that book too. Uh, this, uh, what is it? What's the title? Discovering Cyrus, D D D Discover Discovering Cyrus by by Zarqami. A, a, a very good good book. Uh, again, published by Mage. Thank you. Is it true that the uh, composition of the Shah Nama was started by a poet called Dakiki? And if so, was Dakiki's style adopted by Ferdowsi? Yes. In fact, Ferdowsi cites him, the whole about a thousand baits, a thousand lines, a thousand couplets of poetry. The Ferdowsi shows his gratitude by, by citing those things. Dariri was murdered at the age of 32 by his slave, and as such, you know, we don't know what his ambitions were. He didn't leave anything. All that he has left us is, is uh, uh, about a thousand lines, which Ferdowsi cites and cites him nicely. But of course, those who know poetry uh, do not see the same beauty in Dariri's poetry. Now, if he had continued uh, on, he may have, he may have actually captured. Uh, the, in fact, one of the, one of Ferdowsi's uh, uh, people who encouraged Ferdowsi is is someone who said to him, "You're, you're like Dariri. Why don't you start?" Uh, so, uh, گشاد زبانی جوانی هست سخن گفتن پهلوانی هست why don't you start the shahnameh and that's that's how he was encouraged to do that thank you for mentioning that really. yes go ahead please Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. A lot of, a lot of, yes, cross. Sure, sure. You're right. It's, very, it's a very inclusive text, in fact. But it hasn't been read that way. It, again, it's a, a matter of reception. It seems as though it's been turned into a national narrative by, in, in a way, in a kind of unfortunate way, where 
Iranians feel as though they have to prove themselves against some old enemies, particularly the Arabs, etc., etc., and they have not had this wider vision of, yes, of, of, of seeing how much interracial, uh, inter-ethnic marriage there is in Shahnameh. Manijah, the most beautiful woman in the Shahnameh, is, is, is the, the daughter of Afrasiyab. Manijah, Manam Dukhta Afrasiyab, she says. So it's, uh, it, 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 you're right, it's a very, it's a text of wide vision, but unfortunately, time and again, it has been, it has been reduced to the concerns that the moderns have who have not been able to, uh, to imagine themselves in the glory that, that they think is their, their right. Thank you very much. Yes. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.